Saint Josemaria Escriva de Balaguer y Albas, the 9th of January 1902 to the 26th of June 1975, was a Roman Catholic priest from Spain who initiated Opus Dei, an organization of laypeople and priests dedicated to the teaching that everyone is called to holiness by God and that ordinary life can result in sanctity. He was canonized during 2002 by Pope John Paul II, who declared Saint Josemaria should be counted among the great witnesses of Christianity. Escriva gained a doctorate in civil law at the Complutense University of Madrid and a doctorate in theology at the Lateran University in Rome. His principal work was the initiation, government and expansion of Opus Dei. Escriva's best known publication is The Way, which has been translated into 43 languages and has sold several million copies. Escriva and Opus Dei have aroused controversy, primarily concerning allegations of secrecy, elitism, cult-like practices, and political involvement with right-wing causes, such as the rule of Francisco Franco in Spain 1939 After his death, his canonization attracted considerable attention and controversy, by some Catholics and the worldwide press. Several journalists who have investigated the history of Opus Dei, among them Vatican analyst John L. Allen Jr., have argued that many of these accusations are unproven or have grown from allegations by enemies of Escriva and his organization. Cardinal Albino Luciani, later Pope John Paul I, John Paul II, Benedict XVI, Francis, Oscar Romero, and many Catholic leaders have endorsed Escriva's teaching concerning the universal call to holiness, the role of laity, and sanctification of ordinary work. According to Allen, among Catholics, Escriva is reviled by some and venerated by millions more. Topic: <inaudible> Biography. <inaudible> 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 Early life José María Mariano Escriva y Albas was born to José Escriva y Corzón and his wife, María de los Dolores Albas y Blanc on 9 January 1902, in the small town of Barbastro, in Huesca, Aragon, Spain, the second of six children and the first of two sons. José Escriva was a merchant and a partner of a textile company which eventually became bankrupt, forcing the family to relocate during 1915 to the city of Lagroño, in the northern province of La Rioja, where he worked as a clerk in a clothing store. Young Josemaria first felt that he had been chosen for something. It is reported, when he saw footprints left in the snow by a monk walking barefoot, with his father's blessing, Escriva prepared to become a priest of the Catholic Church. He studied first in Lagroño and then in Zaragoza, where he was ordained as deacon on Saturday 20 December 1924. He was ordained a priest, also in Zaragoza, on Saturday 28 March 1925. After a brief appointment to a rural parish in Pertiguera, he went to Madrid, the Spanish capital, during 1927 to study law at the Central University. In Madrid, Escriva was employed as a private tutor and as a chaplain to the Foundation of Santa Isabel, which comprised the Royal Convent of Santa Isabel and a school managed by the Little Sisters of the Assumption. <laughs> <laughs> Mission as the founder of Opus Dei A prayerful retreat helped him to discern more definitely what he considered to be God's will for him, and, on 2 October 1928, he saw Opus Dei, English, work of God, a way by which Catholics might learn to sanctify themselves by their secular work. He founded it during 1928, and Pius XII gave it final approval during 1950. According to the decree of the Congregation for the Causes of Saints, which contains a condensed biography of Escriva, t. o. this mission he gave himself totally. From the beginning his was a very wide-ranging apostolate in social environments of all kinds. He worked especially among the poor and the sick languishing in the slums and hospitals of Madrid. During the Spanish Civil War, Escriva fled from Madrid, which was controlled by the Republicans, via Andorra and France, to the city of Burgos, possessed by the nationalist forces of General Francisco Franco. After the war ended during 1939 with Franco's victory, Escriva was able to resume his studies in Madrid and complete a doctorate in law, for which he submitted a thesis on the historical jurisdiction of the Abbess of Santa Maria la Real de las Huelgas. The priestly society of the Holy Cross, affiliated with Opus Dei, was founded on Sunday, 14 February 1943. 
Escriva relocated to Rome during 1946. The decree declaring Escriva venerable states that in 1947 and on Monday the 16th of June 1950 he obtained approval of Opus Dei as an institution of pontifical right. With tireless charity and operative hope he guided the development of Opus Dei throughout the world, activating a vast mobilization of lay people. He gave life to numerous initiatives in the work of evangelization and human welfare, he fostered vocations to the priesthood and the religious life everywhere. Above all, he devoted himself tirelessly to the task of forming the members of Opus Dei. Topic. Later years. According to some accounts, at the age of two he suffered from a disease perhaps epilepsy, so severe that the doctors expected him to die soon, but his mother had taken him to Torreciudad, where the Aragonese locals venerated a statue of the Virgin Mary as Our Lady of the Angels, thought to date from the 11th century. Escriva recovered and, as the director of Opus Dei during the 1960s and 1970s, promoted and oversaw the design and construction of a major shrine at Torreciudad. The new shrine was inaugurated on 7 July 1975, soon after Escriva's death, and to this day remains the spiritual center of Opus Dei, as well as an important destination for pilgrimage. By the time of Escriva's death during 1975, the members of Opus Dei numbered some 60,000 in 80 countries. As an adult, Escriva suffered from type 1 diabetes and, according to some sources, also epilepsy. During 1950, Escriva was appointed an honorary domestic prelate by Pope Pius XII, which allowed him to use the title of Monsignor. During 1955, he received a doctorate of theology from the Pontifical Lateran University in Rome. He was a consultor to two Vatican congregations the Congregation for Seminaries and Universities and the Pontifical Commission for the Authentic Interpretation of the Code of Canon Law and an honorary member of the Pontifical Academy of Theology. The Second Vatican Council 1962 confirmed the importance of the universal call to holiness, the role of the laity, and the Mass as the basis of Christian life. During 1948, Escriva founded the Collegium Romanum Sancte Crucis, Roman College of the Holy Cross, Opus Dei's educational center for men, in Rome. During 1953, he founded the Collegium Romanum Sancte Mariae, Roman College of Saint Mary, to serve the women's section. These institutions are now joined into the Pontifical University of the Holy Cross. Escriva also established the University of Navarre in Pamplona and the University of Piura in Peru as secular institutions affiliated with Opus Dei. Escriva died on the 26th of June 1975, aged 73. Three years after Escriva died, the then Cardinal Albino Lucini later Pope John Paul I celebrated the originality of his contribution to Christian spirituality. <laughs> Personality and attitudes <laughs> <laughs> Attitudes in general One of the persons who knew Escriva best was the Bishop of Madrid, where Opus Dei was initiated, Bishop Leopoldo Eijoy Garay, for Escriva would visit and report to him quite frequently and the two established a very strong friendship. In a 1943 report to Rome, the bishop stated, "...the distinctive notes of his character are his energy and his capacity for organization and government, with an ability to pass unnoticed." He has shown himself most obedient to the church hierarchy. One very special hallmark of his priestly work is the way he fosters, in speech and in writing, in public and in private, love for Holy Mother Church and for the Roman Pontiff. Bishop Eijoy Garay wrote to the Jesuit provincial of Toledo, Carlos Gomez Martinho, S.J., during 1941. Father Escrivé is an exemplary priest, chosen by God for apostolic enterprises, humble, prudent, self-sacrificing in work, docile to his bishop, of outstanding intelligence and with a very solid spiritual and doctrinal formation." Eijoy Garay told an officer of the Falange that, T O think that Fr. Josemaria Escriva is capable of creating anything secret is absurd. He is as frank and open as a child. Viktor Frankl, an Austrian psychiatrist and neurologist, founder of «logotherapy» and a Nazi concentration camp survivor, met Escriva in Rome during 1970 and later wrote of 
the refreshing serenity which emanated from him and warmed the whole conversation, and the unbelievable rhythm with which his thought flowed, and finally, his amazing capacity for getting into immediate contact with those with whom he was speaking. Frankel went on. Escriva evidently lived totally in the present moment, he opened out to it completely, and gave himself entirely to it. According to Álvaro del Portillo, who was Escriva's closest collaborator for many years, there was one basic quality of Escriva that pervaded everything else, his dedication to God, and to all souls for God's sake, his constant readiness to correspond generously to the will of God. Pope Paul VI summarized his opinion of what he termed the extraordinariness of Escriva's sanctity in this way. He is one of those men who has received the most charisms supernatural gifts and have corresponded most generously to them. The first impression one gets from watching Escriva live. John L. Allen Jr. writes after watching some movies on the founder of Opus Dei during 2005, is his effervescence, his keen sense of humor. He cracks jokes, makes faces, roams the stage, and generally leaves his audience in stitches in off-the-cuff responses to questions from people in the crowd. Critics, such as Spanish architect Miguel Fisac, who was one of the earliest members of Opus Dei and who associated with Escriva for nearly 20 years before ending his relation with Escriva and Opus Dei, have given a very different description of Escriva as a pious but vain, secretive, and ambitious man, given to private displays of violent temper, and who demonstrated little charity towards others or genuine concern for the poor. According to British journalist Giles Tremlett, biographies of Escriva have produced conflicting visions of the saint as either a loving, caring charismatic person or a mean-spirited, manipulative egoist. French historian Edouard de Blay has referred to Escriva as a mixture of mysticism and ambition. <laughs> Towards God Prayer On the centennial of Escriva's birthday, Cardinal Ratzinger who became Pope Benedict XVI commented, I have always been impressed by Josemaria Escriva's explanation of the name Opus Dei, an explanation gives us an idea of the founder's spiritual profile. Escriva knew he had to found something, but he was also conscious that what he was founding was not his own work, that he himself did not invent anything and that the Lord was merely making use of him. So it was not his work, but Opus Dei God's work, this gives us to understand that he was in a permanent dialogue, a real contact with the one who created us and works for us and with us. If therefore Saint Josemaria speaks of the common vocation to holiness, it seems to me that he is basically drawing on his own personal experience, not of having done incredible things himself, but of having let God work. Therefore a renewal, a force for good was born in the world even if human weaknesses will always remain." In his canonization homily, Pope John Paul II described Escriva as, "...a master in the practice of prayer, which he considered to be an extraordinary weapon to redeem the world it is not a paradox but a perennial truth, the fruitfulness of the apostolate lies above all in prayer and in intense and constant sacramental life." In John Paul II's decree of canonization, he refers to the five brief prayers or aspirations of Escriva through which one can trace the entire life story of Blessed Josemaria Escriva. He was barely sixteen when he began to recite the first two aspirations Domini, ut vidim, Lord, that I might see, and Domina, ut sit, Lady, that it might be, as soon as he had the first inklings of God's call. They expressed the burning desire of his heart, to see what God was asking of him, so that he might do it without delay, lovingly fulfilling the Lord's will. The third aspiration omnes cum petro ad isum per Mariam, altogether with Peter to Jesus through Mary, appears frequently in his writings as a young priest and shows how his zeal to win souls for God went hand in hand with both a firm determination to be faithful to the Church and an ardent devotion to Mary, the Virgin Mother of God. Regnare Christum Volumus. We want Christ to reign. These words aptly express his constant pastoral concern to spread among all men and women the call to share, through Christ, in the dignity of God's children. 
God's sons and daughters should live for the purpose, to serve Him alone, Deo omnis gloria. All the glory to God. During the Thanksgiving Mass for the canonization of St. Josemaria, John Paul II, said, in the founder of Opus Dei, there is an extraordinary love for the will of God. There exists a sure criterion of holiness, fidelity in accomplishing the divine will down to the last consequences. For each one of us the Lord has a plan, to each he entrusts a mission on earth. The saint could not even conceive of himself outside of God's plan. He lived only to achieve it. Saint Josemaria was chosen by the Lord to announce the universal call to holiness and to point out that daily life and ordinary activities are a path to holiness. One could say that he was the saint of ordinary life. Not all Catholic commentators, however, were impressed equally by Escriva's spirituality. For instance, the Swiss theologian Hans Urs von Balthasar wrote in an article of 1963 that Escriva's The Way provided an insufficient spirituality to sustain a religious organization and that the book was hardly more than a little Spanish manual for advanced Boy Scouts. Von Balthasar also questioned the attitudes towards prayer described by the way, declaring that Escriva's use of prayer moves almost exclusively within the circle of the self, of a self that must be great and strong, equipped with pagan virtues, apostolic and Napoleonic. That which is most necessary, which is the contemplative rooting of the word, on good soil. Matthew chapter 13 verse 8, that which constitutes the aim of the prayers of the saints, of the great founders, the prayer of a focode, is something one will search for in vain here. Von Balthasar repeated his negative evaluation of the way during a television interview during 1984. Similar criticism of Escriva's spirituality has been stated by other commentators, for instance, according to Kenneth L. Woodward, a journalist who specializes in articles about the Catholic Church. To judge by his writings alone, Escrivas was an unexceptional spirit, derivative and often banal in his thoughts, personally inspiring, perhaps, but devoid of original insights, whose book The Way reveals, a remarkable narrowness of mind, weariness of human sexuality, and artlessness of expression. Topic. Towards the liturgy Escriva conceived the Mass as the source and summit of the Christian's interior life, a terminology which was later used by the Second Vatican Council. According to Giovanni Battista Re, prefect of the Congregation for Bishops, Saint Josemaria strove with all his strength to make the Eucharist the center of his life. For him, Jesus was not an example to imitate from afar, an abstract moral ideal, but his Jesus, a person we should live alongside continuously." Escriva strove to obey whatever was indicated by the competent authority regarding the celebration of Mass and he took all necessary steps to ensure that the prescriptions of Vatican II, notably in the area of the liturgy, were applied within Opus Dei. As his prayer was much integrated with traditional liturgy, Escriva found the transition difficult and asked Echevarria to help him with respect to the new rites. Although he missed the practices of the old rites, especially some gestures such as the kissing of the paten a small plate, usually made of silver or gold, used to hold Eucharistic bread, he prohibited his devotees to ask for any dispensation for him, out of a spirit of obedience to ecclesiastical norms. He has decided to show his love for the liturgy through the new rite," commented Echevarria. However, when Monsignor Annabel Bugnini, secretary of the Concilium for the Implementation of the Constitution on the Liturgy, learned of Escriva's difficulties, he granted Escriva the possibility of celebrating the Mass using the old rite. Whenever Escriva celebrated this rite, he did so only in the presence of one Mass server. Monsignor Vladimir Felsman, a priest who worked as Escriva's personal assistant before quitting Opus Dei during 1981, claimed in an interview for Newsweek that Escriva was so distraught by the reforms introduced by the Second Vatican Council that he and his deputy, Alvaro del Portillo, went to Greece in 1967 to see if they could bring Opus Dei into the Greek Orthodox Church. Escriva thought the Catholic Church was a shambles and that the Orthodox might be the salvation of himself and of Opus Dei as the faithful remnant." Felsman claims that Escriva soon abandoned those plans as impracticable. Monsignor Flavio Capucci, a member of Opus Dei and the postulator of the cause for Escriva's canonization, denies that Escriva ever contemplated quitting the Catholic Church. 
This was also denied by the Information Office of Opus Dei, which stated that Escriva's visit to Greece during 1966 was done in order to analyze the convenience of organizing Opus Dei in that country, and that Escriva even brought back icons as presents for Pope Paul VI and Monsignor Angelo de L'Aqua then the substitute to the Vatican Secretary of State, whom he had informed of the visit beforehand. Mortification. Escriva taught that, "...joy has its roots in the form of a cross," and that, "...suffering is the touchstone of love," convictions which were represented in his own life. He practiced corporal mortification personally and recommended it to others in Opus Dei. In particular, his enthusiasm for the practice of self-flagellation has attracted controversy, with critics quoting testimonies about Escriva whipping himself furiously until the walls of his cubicle were speckled with blood. Both the practice of self-mortification as a form of penance, and the conviction that suffering can help a person to acquire sanctity, have ample precedent in Catholic teaching and practice. Referring to Escriva, John Paul II stated in Christi Fidel's Omnes, during the Spanish Civil War he personally experienced the fury of anti-religious persecution and gave daily proof of heroism in a constant priestly activity seasoned with abundant prayer and penance. It did not take long before many came to consider him a saint. When the war was over many bishops invited him to preach retreats to their clergy, thereby greatly contributing to the renewal of Christian life in Spain. Many religious orders and congregations also requested his pastoral services. At the same time, God allowed him to suffer public attacks. He responded invariably with pardon, to the point of considering his detractors as benefactors. But this cross was such a source of blessings from heaven that the servant of God's apostolate spread with astonishing speed. Topic. Towards the Virgin Mary Pope John Paul II stated on Sunday 6 October 2002, after the Angelus greetings, "...love for Our Lady is a constant characteristic of the life of Josemaria Escriva and is an eminent part of the legacy that he left to his spiritual sons and daughters." The Pope also said that Saint Josemaria wrote a beautiful small book called The Holy Rosary which presents spiritual childhood, a real disposition of spirit of those who wish to attain total abandonment to the divine will." When Escriva was ten or eleven years old, he already had the habit of carrying the rosary in his pocket. As a priest, he would ordinarily end his homilies and his personal prayer with a conversation with the Blessed Virgin. He instructed that all rooms in the offices of Opus Dei should have an image of the Virgin. He encouraged his spiritual children to greet these images when they entered a room. He encouraged a Marian apostolate, preaching that, To Jesus we go and to him we return through Mary. While looking at a picture of the Virgin of Guadalupe giving a rose to San Juan Diego, he commented, I would like to die that way. On 26 June 1975, after entering his work room, which had a painting of the Virgin of Guadalupe, he slumped on the floor and died. <laughs> Towards people Escriva de Balaguer was a very human saint, preached John Paul II. All those who met him, whatever their culture or social status, felt he was a father, totally devoted to serving others, for he was convinced that every soul is a marvelous treasure, indeed, every person is worth all of Christ's blood. This attitude of service is obvious in his dedication to his priestly ministry and in the magnanimity with which he started so many works of evangelization and human advancement for the poorest persons. Former numerary Maria del Carmen Tapia, born 1925, who worked with Escriva for 18 years inside the organization, seven as his secretary, wrote in her book, Beyond the Threshold, A Life in Opus Dei, that Escriva often became angry, and that as secretary in charge of recording his words and actions, she was not allowed to record anything negative that she witnessed. She claims she was subjected to abusive words from Escriva, who called her filthy names, and then screamed during this meeting with both men and women present, upbraiding a member who helped Tapia send letters. She was kept prisoner in the headquarters of Opus Dei in Rome from November 1965 until March 1966. I was held completely deprived of any outside contact with the absolute prohibition to go out for any reason or receive or make telephone calls or to write or receive letters nor could I go out for the so-called weekly walk or the monthly excursion." 
I was a prisoner. However, some of his devotees claim that, through him, Opus Dei has been able to better the quality of life of many women, and refer to his respect for women and his interest in improving their lives. Historian Elizabeth Fox Genovese, a Catholic convert, asserted that, Opus Dei has an enviable record of educating the poor and supporting women, whether single or married, in any occupation they choose. Topic. Towards his family Opus Dei's founder modified his name in several ways over the course of his life. In the church records of the cathedral at Barbastro, he appears as having been baptized four days after birth with the name José María Julián Mariano, and his surname was spelled Escriba. As early as his school days, José Escriba had adopted the rather more distinguished version spelled with a V rather than a B. His name is spelled Escriva in the memento of his first mass. According to critics like Luis Carandel and Michael Walsh a former Jesuit priest, he also adopted the use of the conjunction Y and joining his father's and mother's surnames. Escriva y Albas, a usage which he claims is associated with aristocratic families, even though that has been the legal naming format in Spain since 1870. On 16 June 1940, the Spanish Bulletin Oficial del Estado, official state bulletin, records that Escriva requested of the government that he be permitted to change his first surname so that it will be written Escriva de Balaguer. He justified the petition on the grounds that the name Escriva is common in the East Coast and in Catalonia, leading to harmful and annoying confusion. On 20 June 1943, when he was 41 years old, the registry book of the Barbastro Cathedral and the baptismal certificate of José María were annotated to represent that the surname Escriba was changed to Escriva de Balaguer. Balaguer is the name of the town in Catalonia from which Escriva's paternal family derived. One of the earliest members of Opus Dei, and a friend for many years, the architect Miguel Fisac, who later quit Opus Dei, said that Escriva found it embarrassing to have his father's family name since his father's company became bankrupt, that he had a great affection for the aristocracy, and that, when Escriva was a chaplain at the foundation of Santa Isabel in Madrid, he would often meet aristocratic visitors who would ask, upon learning that his name was Escriva, whether he belonged to the noble Escriva de Romani family, only to ignore him when they learned that he did not. According to Vázquez de Prada, a writer, Opus Dei member, an official biographer who produced a three-volume biography of Escriva, the act had nothing to do with ambition but was motivated rather by fairness and loyalty to his family. The main problem is that in Spanish the letters B and V are pronounced in the same way and therefore bureaucrats and clerics had made mistakes in transcribing the Escriva family name in some official documents throughout the generations. Defenders of Escriva have also argued that the addition of de Balaguer corresponded to a practice adopted by many Spanish families that felt a need to distinguish themselves from others with the same surname but proceeding from different regions and consequently having different histories. Escriva's younger brother Santiago stated that his brother loved the members of his family and took good care of them. When their father died, he says, Escriva told their mother that she should stay calm, because he will always take care of us. And he fulfilled this promise. Escriva would find time in his busy schedule to chat and take a walk with his younger brother, acting like a father towards him. When the family transferred to Madrid, he obeyed the instructions of their father that he obtain a doctorate in law. Thanks to his docility to this advice, says Santiago. He was able to support the family by giving classes in law, and with this he acquired a juridical mentality, which would later be so necessary to do Opus Dei. Monsignor Escriva also modified his first name. From José María, he changed it to the original Jose Maria. Biographers state, that around 1935, age 33, he joined his first two names because his single love for the Virgin Mary and Saint Joseph were equally inseparable. <laughs> Towards his country Many of his contemporaries recount the tendency of Escriva to preach about patriotism as opposed to nationalism. Critics have alleged that Escriva personally, as well as the organization of Opus Dei, were associated originally with the ideology of national Catholicism, 
particularly during the Spanish Civil War and during the years immediately after it, and that they were therefore also closely associated with the authoritarian regime of General Franco. According to Catalan sociologist Joan Estruch, more than a classic of the spirituality of all time. Escriva de Balaguer is at bottom a child of his time, he is the product of a specific country, a specific epoch, a specific church. These are the Spain of General Franco and the Church of Pope Pius X if Opus Dei had never seen the need to bring itself up to date. As Escriva maintained, Opus would today be a paramilitary, pro-fascist, anti-modernist, integralist reactionary organization. If it is not, it is because it has evolved over time, just as the Catholic Church, the Franco regime, and Monsignor. Escriva himself evolved. Estruch cites, for instance, the fact that the first edition of Escriva's The Way, finished in Burgos and published in Valencia during 1939, had the dateline Año de la Victoria, Year of the Victory. Referring to Franco's military triumph over the Republican forces in the Civil War, as well as a prologue by a pro-Franco bishop, Monsignor, Xavier Lausurica, which ended with the admonition to the reader to "...always stay vigilant and alert, because the enemy does not sleep. If you make these maxims your life, you will be a perfect imitator of Jesus Christ and a gentleman without blemish." And with Christ's like you Spain will return to the old grandeur of its saints, wise men, and heroes. Escriva preached personally to General Franco and his family during a week-long spiritual retreat at the Pardo Palace Franco's official residence in April 1946. Vittorio Messeri claims that the ties between Escriva and Francoism are part of a black legend propagated against Escriva and Opus Dei. Allen states that based on his research Escriva could not be said to be pro-Franco for which he was criticized for not joining other Catholics in openly praising Franco nor anti-Franco for which he was criticized for not being pro-democracy. According to Allen, there is no statement from Escriva for or against Franco. Escriva's devotees and some historians have emphasized his personal effort to avoid partiality in politics. Professor Peter Bergler, a German historian, asserts that Franco's phalangists suspected Escriva of internationalism, anti-Spainism and Freemasonry, and that during the first decade of Franco's regime, Opus Dei and Escriva were attacked with perseverance bordering on fanaticism, not by enemies, but by supporters of the new Spanish state. Escriva was even reported to the tribunal for the fight against Freemasonry. Topic. Awards and honors Escriva received several awards The Grand Cross of Alfonso X the Wise 1951. The Gold Cross of St. Raymond of Peñafort 1954. The Grand Cross of Isabella the Catholic 1956. The Grand Cross of Charles III 1960. Doctor Honoris Causa by the University of Zaragoza, Spain, 1960. The Gold Medal by the City Council of Barbastro, 1975. Some biographers have said that Escriva did not seek these awards, that they were nevertheless granted to him, that he accepted them due to charity to those who were granting these, and that he did not give the slightest importance to these awards. Journalist Luis Carandel, however, recounts testimonies about how members of Opus Dei paid for the insignia of the Grand Cross of Charles III to be made from gold, only to have Escriva angrily reject it and demand instead one encrusted with diamonds. Carandel holds that this episode was part of a larger pattern in Escriva's life of ambition for social prestige and the trappings of wealth. Sympathetic biographers, however, insist that Escriva taught that material things are good, but that people should not get attached to them and should serve only God. It is reported that he declared that, he has most who needs least, and that it took only ten minutes to gather his possessions after his death. Topic. Controversy In addition to the questions raised about the depth of Escriva's spirituality and theological thinking, about his purported habits of secretiveness and elitism although, for the most part, Opus Dei faithful belong to the middle to low levels of society, in terms of education, income, and social status, about his alleged bad temper and ambition for social status and worldly luxuries, several other specific aspects of Escriva's life and work have generated some criticism, particularly regarding his canonization by the Catholic Church. 
These sources of criticism include his alleged private statements in defense of Adolf Hitler, collaboration by members of Opus Dei with right-wing political causes especially during General Francisco Franco's dictatorship in Spain, Escriva's request for the rehabilitation in his favor of an aristocratic title, and allegations that he maintained bad relations with other Catholic officials, of whom he could be very critical in private. Topic. Alleged defense of Hitler. During Escriva's beatification process, Monsignor Vladimir Felsman, who had been Escriva's personal assistant before Felsman quit Opus Dei and became a priest of the Roman Catholic Archdiocese of Westminster and an aide to Cardinal Basil Hume, sent several letters to Fr. Flavio Capucci, the postulator i.e., chief promoter of Escriva's cause. In his letters, Monsignor Felsman claimed that, during 1967 or 1968, during the intermission to a World War II themed movie, Escriva had said to him, Vlad, Hitler couldn't have been such a bad person. He couldn't have killed six million. It couldn't have been more than four million. Felsman later explained that those remarks should be regarded in the context of Catholic anti communism in Spain, emphasizing that during 1941 all of the male members of Opus Dei who then numbered about 50 offered to join the Blue Division", a group of Spaniard volunteers who joined the German forces in their fight against the Soviet army, along the Eastern Front. Another phrase that has been attributed to Escriva by some of his critics is, "...Hitler against the Jews, Hitler against the Slavs, means Hitler against communism." Álvaro del Portillo, who succeeded Escriva as the director of Opus Dei, declared that any claims that Escriva endorsed Hitler were, "...a patent falsehood," and part of, a slanderous campaign. He and others have stated that Escriva regarded Hitler as a pagan, a racist, and a tyrant. See Opus Dei in politics. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Alleged support for right-wing leaders. One of the most controversial accusations against Escriva is that he and Opus Dei were active in bolstering far-right regimes, especially the dictatorship of Francisco Franco in Spain. After 1957, several members of Opus Dei served as ministers in Franco's government. In particular, the «technocrats», most associated with the «Spanish miracle», of the 1960s were members of Opus Dei, Alberto Ulisters, Mariano Navarro Rubio, Gregorio López Bravo, Loreano López Rodo, Juan José Espinoza, and Faustino García Manco. Most of them came to the government with the patronage of Admiral Luis Carrero Blanco who, though not a member of Opus Dei himself, was reportedly quite sympathetic to the organization and its values and who, as Franco grew older, increasingly came to exercise the day-to-day -day control of the Spanish government. According to journalist Luis Carandel, when Ulisters and Navarro Rubio were first appointed to the government during 1957, Escriva gleefully exclaimed, They have made us ministers. Something which Opus Dei has officially denied. On 23 May 1958, Escriva sent a letter to Franco, which said, in part, Although a stranger to any political activity, I cannot help but rejoice as a priest and Spaniard that the chief of state's authoritative voice should proclaim that, the Spanish nation considers it a badge of honor to accept the law of God according to the one and true doctrine of the Holy Catholic Church, inseparable faith of the national conscience which will inspire its legislation. Quote, it is in fidelity to our people's Catholic tradition that the best guarantee of success in acts of government, the certainty of a just and lasting peace within the national community, as well as the divine blessing for those holding positions of authority, will always be found. I ask God our Lord to bestow upon your excellency with every sort felicity and impart abundant grace to carry out the grave mission entrusted to you. During 1963, Swiss theologian Hans Urs von Balthasar, also a Catholic, wrote a scathing critique of Escriva's spirituality, describing Escriva's method of religion as a form of «integrism», also called «Catholic integralism», stating, «Despite the affirmations of the members of Opus Dei that they are free in their political options, it is undeniable that its foundation is marked by Francoism, that that is the «law within which it has been formed». In another essay, published the next year, von Balthasar characterized Opus Dei as an integrist concentration of power within the Church, and the main motivation of integrism as imposing the spiritual with worldly means. 
During 1979, von Balthasar distanced himself from a newspaper attack on Opus Dei which had cited his earlier accusations of integrism. He wrote in a personal letter to the Prelature, sent also to the Neue Zürcher Zeitung, that, "...because of my lack of concrete information, I am not able to give an informed opinion about Opus Dei today." On the other hand, one thing strikes me as obvious, many of the criticisms leveled against the movement, including those of your own journal concerning the religious instruction given by Opus Dei members, seem to me to be false and anti-clerical." Von Balthasar maintained his unfavorable judgment of Escriva's spirituality and repeated it in a television interview during 1984, but he did not renew his criticism of Opus Dei as an organization, in response to the accusations of integrism. Escriva declared that, Opus Dei is neither on the left nor on the right nor in the center, and that, as regards religious liberty, from its foundation Opus Dei has never practiced discrimination of any kind. Opus Dei officials state that individual members are free to choose any political affiliation, emphasizing that among its members were also two important people of the monarchist political opposition of the 1970s in Spain, the writer Rafael Calvo Surer, who was forced into exile by Franco's regime, and the journalist Antonio Fontan, who became the first president of the Senate after the transition to democracy. The alleged involvement of Opus Dei in Latin American politics has also been a topic of debate. According to U.S. journalist Penny Lerno, the 1966 military coup in Argentina occurred soon after its leader, General Juan Carlos Ongania, attended a retreat sponsored by Opus Dei. During his 1974 visit to Latin America, Escriva visited Chile. This visit occurred nine months after the coup d'état in Chile that deposed Marxist President Salvador Allende and installed a right-wing military dictatorship, directed by General Augusto Pinochet. Critics have charged that Opus Dei members endorsed Pinochet's coup and then had a role in the "'Miracle of Chile' of the 1980s similar to that of the "'Technocrats' during the Spanish Miracle of the 1960s. However, among the major right-wing politicians, only Joaquin Lavin who did not occupy public office under Pinochet has been unequivocally identified as a member of Opus Dei. Another member of Opus Dei, Jorge Sabag Villalobos, belongs to a center-left party that opposed Pinochet's regime. Peter Bergler, a German historian and member of Opus Dei, has written that connecting Opus Dei with fascist regimes is a gross slander. Journalist Noam Friedlander states that allegations about Opus Dei involvement with the Pinochet regime are in proven tales. Several of Escriva's collaborators stated that he actually despised dictatorship. John Allen has written that Escriva was neither anti Franco nor pro Franco. Some critics of Opus Dei, such as Miguel Fisak and Damien Thompson, have argued that the group has always sought advancement not only of its message but also of its interests, and that it has consistently courted those with power and influence, without maintaining a coherent political ideology. Topic. Title of nobility Another source of controversy about Escriva was the fact that, during 1968, he requested and received from the Spanish Ministry of Justice the rehabilitation in his favor of the aristocratic title of Marquis of Peralta. According to the official Guía de Grandezas y Título del Reino, Guide to the Grandeships and Titles of the Realm. The title of Marquis had originally been granted during 1718 to Tomás de Peralta, Minister of State, Justice and War for the Kingdom of Naples, by Archduke Charles of Austria. Until 1715, Archduke Charles had been, as Charles III, a pretender to the Spanish throne see War of Spanish Succession, and from 1711 until 1740 he ruled as Holy Roman Emperor and King of Naples. Escriva's successful petition of a title of nobility has aroused controversy not only because it might seem at odds with the humility befitting a Catholic priest, but also because the same title of Marquis of Peralta had been rehabilitated during 1883 by Pope Leo XIII and King Alfonso XII in favor of a man to whom Escriva had no male line family association. The Costa Rican diplomat Manuel Maria de Peralta y Alfaro (1847–1930). On that occasion, the documents ordering the rehabilitation claimed that the original title had been granted during 1738 not 1718 to Juan Tomás de Peralta y Franco de Medina, by Charles of Austria in his capacity as Holy Roman Emperor, not as pretender to the Spanish throne. 
Ambassador Peralta, who during 1884 had married a Belgian countess, Jehan de Clarembo, died without children during 1930. None of his kinsmen in Costa Rica requested the transmission of the Marquisate, but one of them has published an extensive genealogical study that would seem to contradict any claim by Escriva to the title. Escriva did not use the title of Marquis of Peralta publicly and, during 1972, he ceded it to his brother Santiago. The argument by endorsers of Escriva that he requested the rehabilitation of the title as a favor to his family, and that it was his intention from the beginning to cede it to his brother, seems belied by the fact that, during 1960, Santiago had requested for himself the rehabilitation of a different title of nobility, the barony of San Felipe, which was not granted. According to historian Ricardo de la Sierva a former minister of culture in the Spanish government and to architect Miguel Fisac who knew Escriva personally at the time, Escriva's original request for the title might have been part of an unsuccessful attempt to join the Sovereign Military Order of Malta SMOM, a Catholic religious order which required its members to be of noble birth and of which his deputy in Opus Dei, Monsignor, Álvaro del Portillo, was already a member. Several biographers say Escriva prohibited his devotees from asking Asking for the title of Marquis of Peralta. They state that Escriva accepted it due to the advice of some cardinals who told him that he had the obligation to do so for the sake of his brother, Santiago, and so as to practice what he preached about fulfilling civil duties and exercising rights. His brother Santiago said, the decision was heroic because he knew that he will be vilified as a result. Josemaria did what is best for me. After the right amount of time has passed, without making use of the title in fact he never had the intention of using it, he passed the title on to me. Topic relations with other Catholic leaders Pauline Priest Fr. Giancarlo Rocca, a church historian and a professor at the Claritianum in Rome, claims that Escriva actively sought the rank of bishop but was twice refused by the Vatican Curia, first during 1945, and later during 1950 when he and his devotees had lobbied for his appointment as Bishop of Vittoria. According to Fr. Rocca, in both instances the curial officials privately expressed concerns about the organization of Opus Dei and about the psychological profile of Escriva. Sociologist Alberto Moncada, a former member of Opus Dei, has collected and published various oral testimonies about Escriva's difficult relations with other officials of the Catholic Church. In particular, Moncada quotes Fr. Antonio Pérez Tenesa, who at the time was Secretary General of Opus Dei in Rome, as witnessing Escriva's intense displeasure concerning the election of Pope Paul VI during 1963, and later even expressing doubts in private about the salvation of the Pope's soul. Journalist Luis Carandel claims that, during his years in Rome, Escriva kept his distance from the Jesuit superior general, Pedro Arup, to the extent that Arup once joked with Monsignor Antonio Ribéry, the apostolic nuncio to Spain, about doubting whether Escriva really existed. According to Maria del Carmen Tapia, who worked with Escriva in Rome, the founder of Opus Dei had no respect for Popes John XXIII or Paul VI and believed that his own organization of Opus Dei was above the Church in holiness. According to Moncada, Escriva's years in Rome were dedicated in large part to his campaign to make Opus Dei independent from the authority of the diocesan bishops and the Vatican Curia, something which was finally achieved, after Escriva's death, with the establishment during 1982, by Pope John Paul II, of Opus Dei as a personal prelature, subject only to its own prelate and to the Pope. As such, Opus Dei is currently the only personal prelature in the Catholic Church, although this juridical figure, similar in nature to other kinds of hierarchical organization in the Church's history, such as military and personal ordinariates, is fruit of the Second Vatican Council's aim to provide pastoral attention in ways more suited to the actual situation of many of its faithful. In this way, its work complements that of the dioceses, and in some cases even takes the form of a more direct collaboration, for example, when priests of Opus Dei assume pastoral care of parishes at the request of the local bishops. Escriva may have had this in mind when he wrote, The only ambition, the only desire of Opus Dei and each of its members is to serve the Church as the Church wants to be served, within the specific vocation God has given us. Membership in the prelature does not exempt a Catholic from the authority of the local diocesan bishop. Topic beatification and canonization After the death of Escriva de Balaguer on 26 June 1975, the postulation for the cause of his beatification and canonization received many testimonies and postulatory letters from people all over the world. Holy See on the fifth anniversary of Escriva's death, the postulation solicited the initiation of the cause of beatification from the Vatican Congregation for the Causes of Saints. 
One third of the world's bishops an unprecedented number petitioned for Escriva's beatification. His cause for beatification was introduced in Rome on 19 February 1981 on the strength of the apparently miraculous cure during 1976 of a rare disease, lipomatosis, suffered by Sister Concepcion Buyon Rubio, whose family had prayed to Escriva to help her. On 9 April 1990, Pope John Paul II declared that Escriva possessed Christian virtues to a heroic degree, and on 6 July 1991 the Board of Physicians for the Congregation of the Causes of Saints unanimously accepted the cure of Sister Rubio. He was beatified on 17 May 1992. By way of a letter dated 15 March 1993, the postulation for the cause received news about the miraculous cure of Dr. Manuel Novato Ray from cancerous chronic radiodermatitis, an incurable disease, which took place in November 1992. The reported miracle, apparently brought about by Escriva's intervention, was ruled valid by the Congregation for the Causes of Saints and approved by Pope John Paul II during December 2001, enabling the canonization of Escriva. John Paul II, who frequently expressed public endorsement of Opus Dei and its work, canonized Escriva on 6 October 2002. The canonization mass was attended by 42 cardinals and 470 bishops from around the world, general superiors of many orders and religious congregations, and representatives of various Catholic groups. During the days of the canonization event, church officials commented on the validity of the message of the founder, repeating John Paul II's decree Christi Fidel's Omnes on Escriva's virtues, which said that by inviting Christians to be united to God through their daily work, which is something men will have to do and find their dignity in as long as the world lasts, the timeliness of this message is destined to endure as an inexhaustible source of spiritual light, regardless of changing epochs and situations." Criticism of the process Various critics questioned the rapidity of Escriva's canonization. On the eve of Escriva's beatification during 1992, journalist William D. Montalbano, writing for the Los Angeles Times, described it as, "...perhaps the most contentious beatification in modern times." Critics have argued that the process was plagued by irregularities. However, endorsers refer to Fr. Rafael Pérez, an Augustinian priest who presided over the tribunal in Madrid for Escriva's cause, as one of the best experts on canonization. Fr. Perez stated that the process was fast because Escriva's figure is of the universal importance. The postulators knew what they were doing. And, during 1983, the procedures were simplified in order to present models who lived in a world like ours. Fr. Flavio Capucci, the postulator, also reported that the 6,000 postulatory letters to the Vatican showed earnestness. Escriva's canonization was one of the first to be processed after the 1983 Code of Canon Law streamlined the procedures for canonization, and so it was processed more quickly than was typical before. Mother Teresa was canonized even more quickly, having been beatified just six years after her death Escriva was beatified in 17 years. According to journalist Kenneth L. Woodward, the 6,000-page long positio the official document about the life and work of the candidate for sainthood prepared by the postulators was declared confidential, but leaked to the press in 1992, after Escriva's beatification. Woodward declared that, of 2,000 pages of testimonies, about 40% are by either Álvaro del Portillo or Javier Echevarria Rodríguez who, as successors of Escriva at the head of Opus Dei, would have the most to gain from the Church recognizing that organization's founder as a saint. The only critical testimony quoted in the Positio was by Alberto Moncada, a Spanish sociologist who had been a member of Opus Dei and whose testimony might have been easier for the church authorities to dismiss because he had had little personal contact with Escriva and had left the Catholic Church altogether. This critical testimony covered a mere two pages. Critics of the process also questioned the fact that some of the physicians involved in the authentication of the two scientifically inexplicable cures. Achieved through the posthumous intercession of Escriva, such as Dr. Raffaello Cortesini, a heart surgeon, were themselves members of Opus Dei. The Vatican has stated that the medical consultants for the congregation affirmed unanimously that the miraculous cure of a cancerous state of chronic radiodermatitis in its third and irreversible stage in Dr. Manuel Novato Rey, a country doctor in the village of Almendralejo, was 
very quick, complete, lasting and scientifically inexplicable." After six months, the theological consultants, according to the Vatican, also unanimously attributed this cure to Escriva. On the year of his canonization, the Opus Dei prelate reported that the postulation has gathered 48 reports of unexplained medical favors attributed to Escriva's intercession, as well as 100,000 ordinary favors. Former Opus Dei members critical of Escriva's character who claimed that they were refused a hearing during the beatification and canonization processes include Miguel Fisac, a well known Spanish architect who was one of the earliest members of Opus Dei and remained an associate of Escriva for nearly 20 years, Monsignor. Felsman, a Czech-born engineer and Catholic priest from the UK, who was Escriva's personal assistant, Maria del Carmen Tapia, who worked with Escriva in Opus Dei's central offices in Rome and directed its printing press, Carlos Albas, a Spanish lawyer who was also Escriva's first cousin once removed, Maria Angustias Moreno, who was an official of the women's part of Opus Dei during Escriva's lifetime, and Dr. John Roche, an Irish physicist and historian of science who was a member of Opus Dei from 1959 to 19 1973, and managed one of its schools in Kenya. Several groups critical of Escriva and of Opus Dei emerged both before and after the canonization of Escriva, including the Opus Dei Awareness Network Odin, and Opus Libros, both collaborations of former members who now oppose Opus Dei and its practices. According to journalist Kenneth L. Woodward, before the official beatification he was able to interview six other men and women who had lived and or worked closely with Escriva. The examples they gave of vanity, venality, temper tantrums, harshness toward subordinates, and criticism of popes and other churchmen were hardly the characteristics one expects to find in a Christian saint. But their testimony was not allowed to be heard. At least two of them were vilified in the positio by name, yet neither of them was permitted to defend their reputations. Catholic theologian Richard McBrien termed Escriva's sainthood the most blatant example of a politicized canonization in modern times." According to Catholic writer and biographer John Allen such views are countered by many other ex-members, the present members, and the estimated 900,000 people who attend activities of Opus Dei. He says that the interpretation of the facts seems to depend upon one's basic approach to spirituality, family life, and the implications of a religious vocation. Allen's account of Opus Dei and its founder, however, was not accepted by all reviewers as impartial. Topic: <reports>, Reports of discord among judges. Escriva's canonization attracted an unusual amount of attention and criticism, both within the Catholic Church and by the press. Father Capucci, the postulator of Escriva's cause for sainthood, summarized the main accusations against Escriva that he had a bad temper, that he was cruel, that he was vain, that he was close to Spanish dictator Francisco Franco, that he was pro-Nazi and that he was so dismayed by the Second Vatican Council that he even traveled to Greece with the idea that he might convert to the Orthodox religion. A Newsweek article by Woodward claimed that, of the nine judges of the Congregation for the Causes of Saints presiding over Escriva's cause for beatification, two requested a suspension of the proceedings. The dissenters were identified as Luigi de Magistris, a prelate working in the Vatican's Tribunal of the Apostolic Penitentiary, and Justo Fernández Alonso, rector of the Spanish National Church in Rome. According to Woodward, one of the dissenters wrote that the beatification of Escriva could cause the Church grave public scandal. The same article quoted Cardinal Silvio Adi as declaring that many bishops were very displeased with the rush to canonize Escriva so soon after his death. In interviews, José Sariva Martins, Cardinal Prefect of the Congregation for the Causes of Saints, has denied being aware of that dissent. The journal Il Regno, published in Bologna by the Congregation of the Priests of the Sacred Heart the Dehonians, reproduced, during May 1992, the confidential vote of one of the judges in Escriva's cause of beatification, in which the judge asks that the process be suspended and questions the undue haste of the proceedings, the near absence of testimony from critics in the documentation gathered by the postulate 
operators, the failure of the documentation to properly address issues about Escriva's relations with the Franco regime and with other Catholic organizations, and suggestions from the official testimonies themselves that Escriva lacked proper spiritual humility. This document does not identify the judge by name, but he indicates that he met Escriva only once, briefly, during 1966, while serving as a notary for the Holy Office, which implies that the judge in question was de magistris. In his vote, which its own contents date to August 1989, de magistris also argues that the testimony from the main witness, Alvaro del Portillo, who was Escriva's confessor for 31 years, should have been excluded from the proceedings. John Allen Jr. comments that, according to some observers, de magistris suffered as a result of his opposition to Escriva's beatification. De Magistris became director of the Apostolic Penitentiary during 2001, an important position in the Vatican bureaucracy which normally is followed by elevation to the rank of cardinal, and retired less than two years later. However, Pope Francis made De Magistris a cardinal on 14 February 2015. <laughs> Teachings and legacy The significance of Escriva's message and teachings has been a topic of debate, by Catholics and others. The Protestant French historian Pierre Chaunu, a professor at the Sorbonne and president of the Academy of Moral and Political Sciences, said that, "...the work of Escriva de Balaguer will undoubtedly mark the 21st century. This is a prudent and reasonable wager. Do not pass close to this contemporary without paying him close attention." The Catholic theologian Hans Urs von Balthasar, who was appointed cardinal by Pope John Paul II but died during 1988 before his investiture, dismissed Escriva's principal work, The Way, as a little Spanish manual for advanced Boy Scouts, and argued that it was quite insufficient to sustain a major religious organization. However, the monk and spiritual writer Thomas Merton declared that Escriva's book will certainly do a great deal of good by its simplicity, which is the true medium for the gospel message." Critics of Opus Dei have often argued that the importance and originality of Escriva's intellectual contributions to theology, history, and law, at least as measured by his published writings, has been grossly exaggerated by his devotees. However, various officials of the Catholic Church have spoken well of Escriva's influence and of the relevance of his teachings. In the decree introducing the cause of beatification and canonization of Escriva, Cardinal Hugo Poletti wrote during 1981, "...for having proclaimed the universal call to holiness since he founded Opus Dei during 1928, Monsignor Josemaria Escriva de Balaguer, has been unanimously recognized as the precursor of precisely what constitutes the fundamental nucleus of the Church's magisterium, a message of such fruitfulness in the life of the Church." Sebastiano Baggio, cardinal prefect of the Congregation for Bishops, wrote a month after Escriva's death, "...it is evident even today that the life, works, and message of the founder of Opus Dei constitutes a turning point, or more exactly a new original chapter in the history of Christian spirituality." A Vatican paratus or consultor for the process of beatification said that, "...he is like a figure from the deepest spiritual sources." Franz Koenig, Archbishop of Vienna, wrote in 1975, "...the magnetic force of Opus Dei probably comes from its profoundly lay spirituality. At the very beginning, in 1928, Monsignor. Escriva anticipated the return to the patrimony of the Church brought by the Second Vatican Council he was able to anticipate the great themes of the Church's pastoral action in the dawn of the third millennium of her history. The "...absolutely central," part of Escriva's teaching, says American theologian William May, is that "...sanctification is possible only because of the grace of God, freely given to his children through his only begotten Son, and it consists essentially in an intimate, loving union with Jesus, our Redeemer and Savior." Escriva's books, including Furrow, The Way, Christ is Passing By, and The Forge, continue to be read widely, and emphasize the laity's calling to daily sanctification a message also to be found in the documents of Vatican II. Pope John Paul II made the following observation in his homily at the beatification of Escriva. With supernatural intuition, Blessed Josemaria untiringly preached the universal call to holiness and apostolate. Christ calls everyone to become holy in the realities of everyday life. 
Hence work too is a means of personal holiness and apostolate, when it is done in union with Jesus Christ. John Paul II's decree Christi Fidel's Omnes states, "...by inviting Christians to seek union with God through their daily work—which confers dignity on human beings and is their lot as long as they exist on earth—his message is destined to endure as an inexhaustible source of spiritual light regardless of changing epochs and situations." Topic. Writings Escriva, Josemaria 2002, The Way, Leominster, Gracewing, ISBN 978-0-85244-566-2 Escriva, Josemaria Furrow, Princeton, Scepter Publishers, ISBN 0-906138-13-2 Escriva, Josemaria 2003, The Forge, Princeton, Scepter Publishers, ISBN 0-933932-56-1 Escriva, Josemaria, Balaguer, José 2002, Conversations with Monsignor Josemaria Escriva, Princeton, Scepter Publishers, ISBN 978-1-889334-58-5 Escriva, Josemaria 1981, Friends of God, Princeton, Scepter, ISBN 0-906138-02-7 Escriva, Josemaria 1982, Christ is Passing By, Sydney, Little Hills Press, ISBN 0-933932-04-9 Escriva, Josemaria In Love with the Church, Lincoln, London, ISBN 0-906138-26-4 Escriva, Josemaria 2001, Holy Rosary, Princeton, Scepter, ISBN 1-889334-44-8 See also Opus Dei The Way There Be Dragons References Topic Bibliography Topic Further reading Topic External Links Patron Saints Index, Saint Jose Maria Escriva, primary source Saint Jose Maria Escriva, the founder of Opus Dei Saint Jose Maria Institute Documents of the Holy See about Opus Dei and its founder Writings of Josemaria Escriva Odin Opus Dei Awareness Network opposition. Letter from Escriva to Franco Josemaria Escriva and Nazism EWTN webpage, containing biography, spiritual writings, video audio presentation Comments by Popes on Josemaria Escriva Interview with Cardinal Julian Harans about Josemaria Escriva Jose Maria Escriva's Crusade for Holiness, The Life and Times of Opus Dei Founder Most recent accounts of favors received Street. Jose Maria Escriva Historical Institute, Rome